Well, welcome, ladies and lady and gentlemen. It's a little quieter than the last session. Uh, just we uh, we ran through a couple things in the first session in, in track three. This is track three, uh, monitoring Linux with NRPE. And when we are done with this session, we're going to do a quick Q and A for you that weren't in the room, or those of you who weren't in the room the uh, the first session. Um, please wait. Just raise your hand when we do the question and answer session so we make sure we get a microphone over to you so that we get this, it's being recorded, so we make sure that we get both ends of the question and the answer on the recording. All right, well, with that, I want to introduce you to Mike Weber. Thank you. We're going to talk about NRPE, and what I want to talk about in this session is everybody says NRPE is so simple, and yet, what you find is a lot of questions about NRPE, and that all relates to many of the variables. So what I'm wanting to do is walk through all of those variables to help people understand uh, where things are, because it can be very confusing because of all of the options that are out there. And so that's what we want to do. So first of all, let's talk about some basic concepts. NRPE means that you must place an agent on the Linux box. So that agent is going to have a daemon that is listening on port 5666 so that communication can come from the Nagio server. So that's the first thing you have to understand is there's going to be an agent on that Linux box. Nagios is going to use one plugin, check underscore NRPE. Nagios is going to use that plugin to connect to the remote box to execute plugins locally. The plugins are going to execute locally on your client. What that means is you need to have the plugins on the client. So when you think about the client, the Linux box, not only need, does it need to have NRPE daemon, but it has to have the plugins that you want to execute or the scripts that you want to execute on the client. There are direct checks, checks, and indirect checks. So if we look at a uh, direct check, here's an example. Nagios connects to the remote box. Uh, you do have to configure that firewall if that firewall is an issue. And Nagios is just using check NRPE, connects up and says, OK, I'm supposed to run check users. It runs that plugin locally, collects the information, and returns it to Nagios. So the only plugin that actually executes on Nagios is check NRPE. All the rest of the stuff is going to happen on your client. Indirect checks are a little bit different. So what happens with an indirect check is that Nagios connects up to the client and executes a plugin like uh, check HTTP. In other words, it's going to connect up to another box to monitor that other box. This would allow you to have two different networks so that your client could be on two networks and you could be monitoring uh, based on multiple networks. So that's just the indirect concept. So those two are very possible, easily set up. So on the client, these are the things that we've got to have. We've got uh, the daemon, and that daemon is going to mean that you have a location for it on the server. You're also going to have your commands file. That's your nrpe.cfg. This file, text file, is going to have the commands that you're going to execute. So when Nagios connects up, goes through the daemon, comes to this commands file, and says, OK, I'm supposed to execute check users. Where's that command? Finds it in the list and executes it based on the information that you've provided in the file. So you can set up everything to run on the client. All your warning critical states, all your settings can be on that client in that config file if you wanted to, to be that way. And you also have to have those plugins. Uh, all of the plugins have to be on the client. Again, the server is only executing check NRPE and connecting to the client. Of course, the ha server has the host and service definitions in it. Okay, so that gives you the foundation. 
now the variables. And, and this, is a, this is a sad state in some ways uh, because with people wanting to implement NRPE, it can be very frustrating because they're not aware of these many variables. The first variable is how you install the agent. Of course, if you use the repository for CentOS, uh, Dagweir, for example, uh, when you install that RPM Forge, when, when you install that, it's going to install it in a different location than Ubuntu, a different location than SUSE Enterprise. And this can be very frustrating. If you take the agent from Nagios XI, and I'll show you that agent in a second, when you use NRPE in Nagios XI, it says, hey, you've chosen this distribution, here's the agent you should install. That will very likely be in a different location than if you use the Ubuntu repository. So this is where the confusion comes, is trying to figure out where does all this stuff go? It's, it's not that it's not on your system, it's just where did it land? How do I find it? Uh, so the other option is to compile it. So for the systems that I run in my, my test environment and, and one of the recommendations that I make for a lot of companies is you can solve this whole problem by just saying, okay, I'm going to compile everything. I'm going to do everything the same way. Then you find everything in the same location. The files are the same. They all look the same. Everything's the same. All your configurations are synchronized in that way. But I see a lot of organizations that have multiple Linux distributions and install it in different ways. It makes the troubleshooting a nightmare. If your administrators, they, they go to an Ubuntu server and they have to think, okay, where is that nrpe.cfd? They go to a CentOS box and it's in a different location. So this is one of the decisions you're gonna have to make. The daemon that you install may also be different. Uh, I've seen some differences with SUSE Enterprise daemon versus other uh, daemon installs. So when you pull things from distributions, you have to be aware that there could be some differences that your NRPE is going to function a little bit differently. The nrpe.cfg file, which is the commands file, is likely to look different. That shouldn't bother you too much because you're gonna be able to create your own commands, but it may look different. It may have different examples. Some of those configuration files may allow arguments, others may not. So this is something that we have to talk about is this whole argument thing because that's a whole nother level of frustration for people. Where your NRPE daemon is located can be different. So it can be found, if you compile, it's gonna be found in USR local Nagios bin. If you use another method, it's gonna be found in USR S bin. So everything can be in a different place. And you have to be aware, now if your organization only uses Ubuntu servers and you're managing them, then you could use a repository. Uh, you, you would just know that everything is in that location. But you do have to know those locations to be able to figure that out. And you can see the, the daemon config file. Uh, Ubuntu even has, why they do everything different, I'm not sure. So instead of Etsy Nagios, it's Etsy Nagios 3. So you just, again, have to be aware of all the differences. One good thing, this is maybe the only thing that's similar, is this config file, wherever you find it, this is the NRPE daemon file, it's all the same. Only have to modify the allow host line that's in red there. You can see I've got the local host and the IP address of the Nagios server. Uh, so this is what's going to allow Nagios to connect up to the daemon. So this is where you have to pay attention. Notice it's not separated by a comma. Separated IPs are separated by a space. If you had several Nagio servers that you wanted to monitor this box, you just separate those by a space. You can put as many IPs in here as you want. So this is basically how this is uh, set up. Now, again, typically, 